Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Band Together Leadership Seminars. My name is Paul Everts and CEO and founder of Band Together Leadership. Love you to contact me, please, at my email address, B-A-N-D, the number two together, together at comcast.net. You can also go to our handsome website, which is conductingmylife.com, where you can buy our book, Conducting My Life. Buy the book. It's a really good book. It's got a lot of nice stories about what it's like to be a high school teacher, and I, I think you'll like it. Uh, we are in a real mm, situation right now, as far as the world goes. The Afghanistan, not going to get political, but that's on people's hearts. Uh, tonight we have a vigil for uh, one of the students uh, at the school I currently teach at. And remember, I don't mention the school I teach at because this has nothing to do with the school. Uh, this has everything to do with uh, me and my wanting to help people get through the day, get through life. The tragedy of losing 13 servicemen and women, awful. And when one is from the high school that you teach at, it, it causes one to pause. Especially knowing that P.J. Everts, our son, Lieutenant Everts of the United States Navy, it could happen to him. And so, our, you know, again, God bless Nicole G. God bless all of them. God bless anybody who had to deal with that misery. Uh, we have a, a student at Folsom High School. I don't teach at Folsom, but it's near where we live because, again, I'm 20 minutes northeast of Sacramento, California, and he's fighting for his life. So, oh, so we have that. And then we have the fires, the Caldor fire. Um, I'm praying for... Tom and Chris and their Celio Ranch. The Celio Ranch is a beautiful refuge for the family. And uh, last night they were heroes. They were heroes right now. They're fighting the fire to protect the Celio Ranch, which was established in 1863. So we have that. And then, of course, I'm getting over COVID. August cannot end soon enough. Today is August the 31st, Tuesday. Thank God, literally, praise Jesus that August is done. Let's get to September and hopefully it's better than August. Um, also, we had a couple of teachers do things. Um, when you say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, there's only one flag. Well, this California teacher thought it would be cute to have the kids say the Pledge of Allegiance to a, another flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag. And then where does it say after that? Anyway, gosh darn it. And now we had a, a, a teacher uh, on Veritas say things that I just don't get. I'm 55 years old. I've taught since 1989. We were taught to stay with the subject. Well, see, I'm teaching social sciences, and therefore we can talk about whatever we want. No, you can't. Well, you're not supposed to, at least. And then you look in your classroom, and you've got flags that have nothing to do with the United States as far as everybody, encompassing everybody. Well, those red, white, and blue stripes, flags, whatever, they, oh, no, they don't represent me. They represent the United States of America. When you hang flags that represent a group of people, that's a group of people you've excluded a group of people. When you hang a flag that represents the country, yeah, I think schools should have the USA flag, the state flag, and if you have one, the city flag in your classroom. At least the flag of the United States of America. Well, some dude uh, at a, a high school near Sacramento thought he would go ahead and tell us how he is radicalizing his students and how it's just, it's, it's just nasty. So on my last podcast, we talked about discernment. And John Maxwell did a wonderful writing on discernment. And we did discernment right now. So, you know, I'm reading a pretty controversial book by Vadi Bakum called Fault Lines. The Social Justice Movement and Evangelicalism's looming catastrophe. Um, this is not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Me reading. No, that's, yeah, that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I'm reading starting on page 229 of the book, Fault Lines, The Way Forward. In the end, it is forgiveness that heal our wounds. My, the author's hope, my hope is not that white Christians can feel sorry 
enough for their past or that ministries and organizations can dig up and grovel over enough historical dirt. That is not the powerful, life-changing, world-confounding message of the gospel. That is the message of the world. The author has heard a mantra lately that rings hollow in his ears. Here it is, quote, There can be no reconciliation without justice, unquote. When the author hears that, he wants to scream, quote, Yes, and the death of Christ is that justice, end quote. All other justice is proximate and insufficient. It is because of Christ's work on the cross that, that we can heed the apostle's admonition, quote, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31, 32. Who am I? asks the author, who am I to tell a white brother that he cannot be reconciled to me unless, until he has drudged up all the racial sins of his and his ancestors past and made proper restitution? Christ has atoned for sin. Now again, I probably lost three of you because I said Christ, but I'm, tr I'm attempting to explain the other side. You've all got this social justice, this critical social justice going. You all got critical race theory. I read Ibram Kendi's book. I read parts of Robin DeAngelo's Right Fragility book. I can't read the whole thing. I can't. I have nothing to be guilty for. I have no white fragility. I No, stop it. But I'm giving you an idea how some Christians, hopefully most Christians, deal with this. Again, I continue the way forward. Consequently, the most powerful weapon in our arsenal is not calling for reparations. It is forgiveness. You don't need to be a Christian to have forgiveness. You don't need to be a part of any religion. I'm explaining to you how I make it through all the name calling. I had someone just write to me the other day, it's, I hate you, the worst music teacher in the world. God bless you. God bless you, and I hope someday Jesus Christ touches your heart to stop being anonymous, put your name on everything, okay? I pray for you. You're wicked right now. You're evil right now. I challenge you. Yeah, I do. Stop with the anonymity. Put your name on it. Call me. Let's go. Because I need to forgive you. You need to, for well, you do whatever you want. You're going to die eventually like I am. So in the end, we both die. Anti-racism knows nothing of forgiveness. Let me say that again. Anti-racism knows nothing of forgiveness because anti-racism knows nothing of the gospel. Instead, anti-racism offers endless penance, endless judgment, and endless fear. What an opportunity we have to shine the light of Jesus in the midst of darkness. The author realized in 2006 that he had been blessed in order to be a blessing. He had been given much so that he, Vadi Bakum, could give much. A decade earlier, the Lord had called Vadi Bakum to lead his family away from churches where everybody looked like us, and we became strangers in a strange land. Now, he, capital H, was calling Vadi Bakum to go to a place where most everybody looked like us, and we would remain strangers in a strange land. Vadi Bakum is not African. Vadi Bakman is not an African American. Vadi Bakman is an American, and he would not want to be anything else. I wish you would all say that. Gosh darn it. America does not owe Vadi Bakum anything. America has blessed him beyond measure. If anything, Vadi Bachman owes the United States of America. More importantly, he owes my Savior, our Savior. And by extension, Vadi Bachman owes his brothers and sisters in Christ. This book was hard to write. He knew that no matter how careful he was, how ironic 
differential or how gracious the very content of this book would be deemed offensive, unkind, and insensitive, some will go as far as calling it violence. So why write the book? He wrote this book because he loves God more than life, the truth more than others' opinions of Vadi Bachman, and the bride of Christ more than his platform. My heart is broken. That's Vadi Bachman's heart is broken as he watches movements and ideologies against which he has fought and warned for decades become entrenched at the highest and most respected levels of evangelicalism. He wants this book to be a clarion call. He wants to unmask the ideology of critical theory, critical race theory. He wants to unmask intersectionality in hopes that those who have imbibed in it can have the blinders removed from their eyes and those who have bowed in the face of it can stand up, take courage, and from Jude 3 say, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. He harbors no animosity against anyone named in his pages of this book. And if you happen to agree with his perspective on these issues, he hopes you don't either. His goal is not to destroy, but to expose, warn, and correct in hopes that, quote, they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by the devil to do his will. That's 2 Timothy 2, verse 26. And yes, Vadi Bachman does mean to call these ideologies demonic. We need to rise to the challenge. The history of the church is replete with moments like these. Moments where dear brothers disagreed passionately and publicly over issues they saw as threats to the gospel. This is such a moment. A moment like the one we faced, one faced by Charles Spurgeon in the downgrade. And J. Gresham Macon, M-A-C-H-E-N. J. Gresham Macon facing modernism. In this moment, Macon, again, M-A-C-H-E-N, made a statement that could absolutely be made in ours. He says, Men tell us that our preaching should be positive and not negative, that we can preach the truth without attacking error. But if we follow that advice, we shall have to close our Bible and desert the Bible's teachings. The New Testament is a polemic book almost from beginning to end. Vadi Bachman hopes this book helps better equip us to be, quote, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Vadi Bachman also, Bachman also hopes to embolden you, us, to pull back the curtain and expose the wizard. Call out the boy who called Wolf. Proclaim that the emperor has no clothes and any other metaphor you can think of for shedding light on these fault lines. Not so you can defeat your brethren in an argument, but so you can engage your brethren with the hopes of winning them. Love your brothers and sisters enough to contend with them and for them. Pastors, Vadi Bakum begs you to consider what he has written. Vadi Bakum believes the church, your church, is under attack. As shepherds, we must defend the sheep. We must repel the wolves. And yes, the wolves are many. However, this one is within the gates and has the worst of intentions. He desires to use your genuine love for the brethren as leverage. Don't let him. Recognize the difference between the voice of the good shepherd who calls you to love all the sheep, all the sheep, all of them. Not the ones that look like you or think like you, all of them. And the voice of the enemy that tells you some of them are guilty, blind, ignorant oppressors and that others are oppressed, all based on their melanin skin color. Reject cries that take principles and stories of individual restitution and isegetically twist them into calls for multi-generational reparations. Reject the cries of those who twist the repentance of Daniel and Ezra, number one, on behalf of theocratic Israel, and number two, for the sin that took place during their lifetime 
in an effort to promote multi-generational ethnic guilt that rests upon all white people of virtue by virtue of their whiteness. Quote, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, end quote, chapter 2, or uh, book 2, Corinthians chapter 5, 16. And why is this? Because there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 through 29. So beyond that, remember Ezekiel's words. He says, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of your father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So if you are a person who has imbibed this ideology, let it go. Find freedom. Find freedom in Christ. 1 Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. End quote. So why then would you hold on to guilt for sins committed by or against your distant grandparents. And if you do, why only stop at slavery and Jim Crow? What about the other commandments broken by our distant kin? You know, no beloved. Quote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Chapter 1, John, verse 1, uh, excuse me, 1 John, chapter 1, verse 9. That is who we are since, quote, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, verse 12. And because of this, we can rest in reconciliation. And it goes on from there. I'm not going to read everything, but I think you get it. Ladies and gentlemen, created in the image of Christ. If you want to be more open, created in the image of God, just remember, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I hate to be preachy, but sometimes, you know, (laughs) Paul, how, how do you again get through everything? Reading, praying, understanding what God wants. You know, I'm going to end my career soon. And the reason I'm going to end it sooner than later is because I want to be a better man. Uh, I want to be a better man, a better human. I wanted to get closer to God. And as I've gotten closer to God, um, people have left me. Uh, I know I've been blocked. I've been um, mocked and on and on. That's cool. That's what happens. That's what happens when you're a Christian. Accept it. It's normal. But you know what? You also get to choose who your friends are. And your friends are the ones that let you be a Christian. Your friends are the ones who let you be a Jew. Your friends let you be you. And that doesn't say you get to do anything you want to. No, it's not that it means. But when you see people pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, there's only one flag of the United States of America. And that teacher you believe in Antifa? That is on your time. This is my room. This is my man cave. Okay? I didn't read that to my students because it's inappropriate to read that to my students, as it's inappropriate for you. To sit there and go, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and say, that's the flag. No, it's not. There's no 
stars. There's no blue rectangle. There's no red, white, blue stripes alternating. That's not the flag of the United States. What kid's going to say that to you, teacher? And when they do, you mock them. My students, all of them, are gifts. They're gifts from God. And I can say that in my man cave. I can say that. 20, 30 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say that. Now? No. But then I can, I guess when I get all tatted up, looking cool, young dude, yeah. Go check out that story by Veritas on the Intercom High School teacher and see what he was saying. And even if you agree with him, I wish you'd be mature enough to say that's not appropriate in the classroom. That needs, I guess, to use your terminology, that needs to be a safe space. When the kid takes your class, they're not going in there to be indoctrinated. Sorry, dude, whatever your name is, Gabe, I guess it is. So that's why I got so deep into this today. Begin with the end of mind. Every choice you make is who you are. Choose wisely. Seek first to understand, then be understood. And finally, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I love you. I took a big risk today. No one has to watch this. Okay? That's the beauty of doing it in my man cave. Never, ever have read that to my class. Never. Because they're not there for that stuff. I read it to help me get through the day. Find what you need to get through the day. Praise Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. I love you. Be strong. Bye.